Okay, we can start. He got the. So, Namaskar, Jatinji. Nice to meet you. Namaskar, Jatinji. Wonderful Namaskar. meeting you. And uh, it's a great honor and a daunting privilege to engage you in a conversation on your wonderful book, a very fascinating book. Thank you. Voice of the Lost Horizon, which I read avidly, couldn't, uh, found it simply unputdownable. So many questions arose in my mind while, while reading it. So this <clears> is an <throat> opportunity for me and for the listeners and viewers uh, to uh, uh, find out more about your fascinating journey to uh, the Andamans and your great seminal work on uh, the vanishing languages there. So we have put together a fascinating book in which you have tales and songs and also a riveting narrative, a compelling narrative about your own journey. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was uh, a perilous journey. It wasn't a very comfortable journey. It wasn't an adventure mm -hmm. narrative. So <laughs> no. you nearly lost your life. You you could have been bitten by a water snake and you, <laughs> so and you also learned a survival pumping the uh, light stove. And uh, many interesting things you I think uh, I was charmed by your account of how you became a hunter and gatherer to escape starvation on the island. So it's as I it's a compelling narrative and it's also a wonderful collection of tales and songs of a vanishing tribe, uh, tales and songs written in a language which will no longer be uh, spoken by people. The last speakers of some of these uh, languages are uh, dead. So it's a fantastic book. At the same time, it's a tragic book. Uh, one feels very sad. A sense of profound sadness also envelops one when one reads this book. So I'll begin by asking you, uh, few questions about uh, uh, your this uh, wonderful book, Voices from the Vanishing uh, Horizon, from Voices from the Lost Horizon, published by Niyogi Books. And it's, as I told you, it's a riveting, compelling uh, book, which I found simply unputdownable. And many questions arose in my mind, and those will read it. I hope lots of people will read it, because something much, much more is at stake. It's not just a question of a language disappearing or a speaker of a language dying, the last speaker of a language dying. I think much more is at stake. And you have vividly brought a lost world alive to us. So mm -hmm. may I begin by asking you um, this question. Many languages in the world are facing extinction. This, of course, presents a very bleak scenario. What aroused your interest in the fate of endangered and dying languages? Thank you, uh, Jatinji. But before I start answering your question, I would like to thank the organizers of Bhav Samvad and also uh, giving me an opportunity that I'm sitting across the seven seas in New York, in New Jersey, to, to be connected to all of you. Uh, as uh, I'm very thankful to Jatinji to read the book, thoroughly because I can sense his sensibilities towards the language and the narrators that are the invisible authors of this very book. Yes, my journey in uh, Great Andamani's language, its culture, its ethos, its worldview, and many, many other aspects of many realms where language is used, the domains that language must have been used has been very challenging for me. And I have tried to unearth as much as I best to my ability. I, I mean, I'm not more capable. I have not left any part of my capability untapped. Whatever I could, I did. But coming to your exact pointed question, what really attracted me to dying languages, let me confess that I have not worked on many dying languages before this. In fact, when I reached Andaman in the late 2000, it was, I think, December 2000, we were conducting a language survey of the Andaman Islands, and that included Little Andaman as well as Great Andaman. And I realized there were 
many indian languages spoken there are almost 18 of them including hindi gujarati marathi tamil telugu but along with that there were three distinct languages initially known as andamanese tribal languages onge jarwa and great andamanese and i had a pilot i lived with these communities but not jarwa with onges and great andamanese to record their initial uh, speech or whatever i could get and when i analyzed this i realized that uh, the jarwa and onge are very distinct languages a way much much different from the great andamanese and that was one of the main reasons the topography of the reason the region the inaccessibility of the region the challenges that posed me that there were not much published material available on this language as well as the fact that perhaps most of you know now the antiquity of the tribes you know they are the remnants of the first migration out of africa 70000 years ago and according to population geneticists they lived in isolation all throughout till the penal colony in 1858 was established by the britishers so here this this was a community which has maintained and survived for thousands of years and along with that whatever little remains had been there of their language was also survived so this is what attracted me to the great andamanese the challenges the challenges of exposing myself to some of the very very ancient heritage of india the challenging of yeah. myself of working with those people who have very different life pattern than us i had never worked on hunter and gatherers before this i had never been on the sea for so long to have worked on konkani the four varieties of konkani but i never lived like this the way i lived in the andaman so all these challenges though i was getting old but i was all these challenges were too attractive to leave so i thought maybe i should do this so this is what plunged me but basically their antiquity and the second fact which is very important for readers or the viewers or the listeners to know that the jarwa and onge seemed very different from great andamanese so in 2003 i postulated that great andamanese seem to be a language family apart and later on in 2005 population geneticists corroborated my research so i was very overwhelmed and it is true that you know the great andamanese had 10 languages initially but by the time i reached the remains of only four were left so great andamanese constituted the sixth language family of india so all these challenges you know really attracted me to this particular area and the language but to be very frank with you i never worked on dying languages before this so this was my very first experience <clears throat> but you have been uh, exceptionally brave in facing those challenges so um my next question would be as someone who has worked extensively on the death of languages could you please enlighten us on what happens when a language dies what are its deeper consequences for humanity because language loss the death of language is now a growing phenomenon uh, world over and everybody is worrying about many languages becoming in, uh, extinct so uh, in the next few years so what are its human consequences what are its cultural civilizational consequences what would you lose is it just a language that we are no. going to lose that something far more precious something far more important so yeah <laughs> generally some... people think that language loss is nothing nothing great one loses a language so what there are thousands of languages in the world <clears throat> excuse me my throat is not uh <clears throat> giving me support anyway so the you know the language loss is a humongous loss in human life you see language loss is a loss of experiences of life sustaining knowledge base and that's very few people realize you see that it is in fact it is the loss of cognition it is the loss of expression it is the loss of the knowledge base about your environment be it uh, ecological or anything else and above all the kind of uh, world view that a language contains very few people know this that the grammar is not just set of definite rules it also emotes it also codes 
your cognition, your the way you perceive the world. And the Great Andamanis turned out to be a very unique language because the kind of worldview that this language encompassed was reflected in its grammar. So I had to work on this grammar too. And now the book is published on grammar from Netherlands. It came out in 2013. The language loss is also very crucial uh, loss for us, which should be reckoned with because each language is a distinct language in linguistic diversity. Each language is a evolved, ever evolved language form which basically tells us the capacity of human for language, you see? So this is a very important aspect that if every language is distinct and, it's, and every language has a distinct way of evolving and that process of evolution is very important for us to know. So language loss is a loss of actually a life sustaining the basically secrets of survival which are logged in languages are very important. And I will give you a very uh, um, a quoted example of mine, that when tsunami came, we lost 5,000 people in Andaman Nicobar, but not a single death in tribals, because the tribals languages had encoded the secret of survival. And they all knew by just looking at the pattern, of course, their knowledge of nature was much better than us. So they knew by looking at the pattern of the waves, that a havoc or some kind of an earthquake is coming, which is devastating. So they ran into their, you know, whatever the areas, the Onges ran into deep into the forest, Jarwas ran on the top of a hill, so did the great Andamanis did, because the language has encoded these secrets of survival. So language is a very essential part of human knowledge as well as human cognition. So that's why language loss is a very, 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 uh, irreparable loss because it is very difficult to uh, fathom the uh, the beauty and the treasure that you lose when you lose your language. Yeah, you have already told us uh, something very interesting about why uh, or what led you to the Andamans or what led you to investigate the language situation in Andamans. But in many places of your book, you talk about the bureaucratic hostility that you faced. Oh, yes. While conducting your investigation, you must be the only linguist in the world who came uh, to be arrested, nearly arrested, uh, <laughs> for listening to a story, uh, hearing a story from a tribe. So, and you also, I think, you had to, you had somebody demanded a bribe from you, and you say that you, ni you neither had the means nor the inclination to grease his palms. So, you have so much hostility, you face so much, uh, so many difficulties. So, what sustained you? Uh, and the life wasn't, I mean, it was a terribly inhospitable uh, world. The islands were terribly inhospitable in many ways, I think. Bats and insects would wander into your room and water snake, the crocodiles, uh, the creeks were infested with crocodiles. It's a terrible uh, uh, landscape that you paint. But at the same time, you spend so many years of your life investigating the language, the linguistic landscape of this world. So what sustained you? One is curious about that. So please tell us something about Paradoxically, it. Paradoxically, Jatinji, it was my helplessness, my anguish, my anxiety, my anger, and my helplessness state of affairs sustained me. It's, uh, <laughs> I felt more and more challenged. And I remember in the mainland, whenever my linguist friend heard that I was working on Andaman, they said, aren't you afraid of crocodiles? Aren't you afraid of uh, water snakes that you mentioned? I said, no, but I'm afraid of bureaucrats because they, they, they conveniently lose my file to give me permit to visit the Strait Island where I worked. That's my Karam Bhumi. And uh, they will conveniently uh, just don't give me pass for more than 14 days. So I had to go back and forth in the boat, you know, to renew my pass. You know, the, I, all kinds of, I mean, this, I should not be critical of them now uh, because the, those officers are gone. And the after my complaint, some officers have uh, developed sensibilities towards researchers. Somehow they hate researchers, maybe because they think we'll expose them. But my idea was not to expose them. My idea was to get deeper into the language which was going, going gone. 
You see, I wanted to get the last of whatever is left, but they did not realize this. So I had a lot of problems. Yes, these challenges actually sustained me. And I have a nature that I generally, you know, turn the odds against me into my favor. And this has, had, this has happened all throughout my fieldwork, you know, in my... I have written also the in my book, they have a book called Manual of Linguistic Fieldwork and Structures of Indian Languages. When I started my fieldwork course in JNU in 1976, people said, how would a woman, uh, you see, can do a real fieldwork because you have to go into villages and, you know, the woman traveling is not, even that those days it was not that safe, but people don't accept you. But my experience shows that woman is a blessing. Being woman is a blessing. And everywhere I went, because I was a woman, I was given a very good treatment. I was entertained by people. So as I was telling you, Jatinji, I generally have this habit of turning odds against me into my favor. So when I realized there are so many odds in this land, I said, OK, here we go. I Let me see how do I do with it. And thanks to the undermine, you have, you have accepted me. <laughs> but you have a reason to be grateful to the Xerox because they delayed processing your file and you escaped the tsunami. So yes. you have reason yes, to be yes, grateful yes. Them for that. That was the, that was the pro yeah, I had that, uh, well, my JNU faculty and the, sorry, JNU administration was very supportive. When I say administration, I don't mean JNU, I mean uh, basically Andaman administration. But yes, on tsunami, uh, uh, before the tsunami, we were to be in Andaman as exactly on Strait Island on 26th of December when the tsunami came. But my files in JNU got delayed because of some signature problems. And I remember I, I was so depressed. I just left Delhi and I went to Dehradun to spend a weekend with my friend because I just didn't want to think about it that I'm not going to Andaman. <laughs> and there when I was about to leave, I realized the tsunami had struck and they were showing on television what kind of devastating effects it has brought. And I just, you know, caught my throat and I said, oh my God, this was, I was to be saved by the, you know, the supernatural powers of Grandamani's perhaps to, you know, to work on their language. <laughs> okay. Well, that's life. Yeah. So one of the folk tales you have collected, uh, you have collected some six, seven folk tales in your book and uh, put them together there. Wonderful. In fact, they some of them are so sad. Some of them can be so insightful. They give us such insights into the human condition. Um, in one of these, I one of these book tales remind one uh, reminds one of the story of Pygmalion. Uh, the sculptor uh, creating or sculpting the image of a beautiful woman and then falls in love with that uh, sculpture and finally gods uh, vivify breathe life into this sculpture and he marries this beautiful woman so there is one such folk tale here so what elements of universality can we discover in these fascinating narratives are these just unique to andamans or do they share certain elements certain characteristics with the myths uh, creation myths the other kinds of myths that are uh, that circulate in the world that we are familiar with in the world since you're an expert in this field, I think uh, you see, our viewers will be. I'm a linguist. I'm not a literary critic, though I used to create literature at my previous birth, as I should say, because I started as a short story writer of Hindi, but I gave up, you know, in 75. Uh, <clears throat> but I really am not a critic, so I do not know how to answer your questions uh, properly. But it's amazing that how critics interpret the same, two critics or different critics interpret the same story differently. What you call a Pygmalion kind of a story, it's a creation myth. And my narrator thought it was the biggest love story ever told. Because, and I understood why, because the protagonist creates his own partner. Nowhere in any creation tale of India or Indian tribes, I have collected quite a few, but uh, not all. I can say that never ever have come across a come across a creation tale where the protagonist creates his own partner. Unlike Pygmalion, there is no distress and no sorrow and there is no depression. The two live happily ever after. And not only that, it's a, I think it's a very, uh, very deep 
a very complex but very deep story because it talks of Panchbhut, the five elements of life. It talks about a metaphysical world of leaving this world without any attachment going to the other world, almost like what we say Nirvana. Even in Jataka stories or in our Sanskrit literature, you don't find such kind of stories where, you know, you leave this world happily on voluntarily you snap the ties between this world and the other world. So I think what you call it as a Pygmalion, I, I consider it initial part. Yes, maybe it can be like Pygmalion, but not the later, later part. The later part is very serious and very deep philosophical, philosophically rooted story. As far as other stories are concerned, I found them very unique. Number one, they are so much engulfed in their nature. And you know, the, these uh, Andamanis were seafarers. So you must have noticed they're talking about all the time sea, the sea animals. For example, there is a story where the protagonist sleeps on a turtle. And I thought this was just a myth. But when I went into Andaman and I realized they have a uh, leatherback turtles, which are as could be as long as eight feet six to eight feet long, you see, and very wide, almost like your dining table. So was, yes, one could sleep on a turtle. And I also realized that, you know, there are many information I was just telling you in the beginning of my talk that language encodes your ecological knowledge. And I realized that the fishing for big animals should be done at night. And the kind of description that now Junior gave me of emitting lights from dolph from, uh, from dugong or from other big creatures in the C was amazing and I checked on Google and I realized that he, what he was correct because there are some lights emit when these big animals traverse in the water. So the, the lang that's why these stories make very unique reading because none of us are very much aware of the sea life. The other thing is you must have noticed there are a couple of stories with supernatural powers. Yes, yes. That, uh, that one universality I thought uh, shared with a granting a curse. You see, I thought granting curse was a very Sanskritized or our Brahmanical, you know, thought, which are in, encased in our ancient literature in Sanskrit. But when I realized that they also had this uh, uh, tradition of cursing, I was a little shocked. And the second was that, uh, you know, the, the supernatural powers, you can say, but some streak of cannibalism that I found in these stories, two of them. I did not uh, find in any other story or stories in India or mainland India. So it seems uh, when I asked now Junior, the narrator, that is it true that Andamanis were cannibals or they, they you know, they lavished human flesh? He says, no, 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 that's not correct. Only one or two people who had supernatural powers did it. And once the, these ancestors made my father eat uh, portion, a part of human flesh. He did not know it was human flesh. The moment he started eating, he choked. Uh, he choked and he had to be saved and he lost his hearing power since then. So it has been looked down upon. This whole practice had been looked down upon. Even in the stories, you realize that it is not something which is of honor or revered about. So there are, there are interesting, unique features, but there are a couple of universalities like of uh, cursing and you know you know and and of course the, the the bond between mother and son is is a human bonding all you know it's a universal phenomena it also it comes out very very prominently and poignantly in one of the stories and there are other stories of uh, the you know the, the 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 jealousy between the wife uh, and his ex and her ex lover and kind of things which are very common you see Okay, yeah. And I think one of your narrators uh, compared cannibalism with uh, goddess Kali drinking yes. blood and all that. And you didn't feel very comfortable. Really that. You didn't want to contradict. But that's a very interesting part of the collection of the narrative. So, and when I yeah. try to refute him, he says, "Why? Your, why does your goddess Kali uh, wear the mala of skulls? Mundo ki yeah. mala kyo pehenti hai?" I said, I yes. never thought about it. Kyo I said, Isi liye hai. Because she was like our, you know, and she mentioned this Juro. Juro was the name of the protagonist. She said, she was like a Juro. I said, I do not know. And I gave up arguing yes. with him. <laughs> very interesting take on our myth uh, from the point of view of Bahan Andamani's speaker. 
Uh, now that the last speakers of some of these Andamanese languages are dead, is there any possibility of these languages being revived through the kind of admirably meticulous documentation you have carried out? Is there any possibility of these being revived? Like Hebrew got revived, although it wasn't uh, used in daily life for a very, very long time. Any possibility of these being revived in future? You see, this is a very uh, loaded question for uh, linguists as well as for a uh, lame person. You see, language revive at the moment, at present into 2021 is possible uh, because there are still three speakers left in the Strait Island. They know the language, they don't speak it. But if the government of India initiates, I'm sure it can be revived and it can be taught to those children living in Strait Island. They go to Anganwadi as well as those children who go to Vivekanand school in Port Blair, it can be revived. But after these th three people are gone, my documentation alone may not be able to revive. And the reason being, this is the second aspect of language revival. You see, the language revival depends on a heavy documentation of the language by linguists. When I reached the island, I did not record the language in various domains. You see, the language is you for revival. The language is used in various domains. You use it for scolding. You use it for you abusing. You use it for hunting. You use it for daily life. And the, if you start thinking, Jatinji, you would realize that there is not a single aspect of your even while sleeping, you are speak you are speaking something to your wife or to your or whoever is with you, your children. Those sentences. Who has recorded those sentences? How do you say goodbye to a person? while you're retiring? How do you, what do you say when you're leaving the house? You know, these are various domains. We generally document all these domains when we are working on a living language. But when a dying language, you're confronted with a dying language, I have lost all those domains. I do not know how Andamanese was spoken in these domains because the Andamanese was not used. So my documentation pertains to the grammar and so anybody can speak great Andamanis by going through this grammar. And luckily, I've also documented as much as possible. And for the viewers, it should be known that it's uh, it's uh, archived on the University of London website. And uh, they can just punch my name and then can get the all the audio files, all the video files, all the text files, whatever we could. But as I said, we reached the island in 2000, late 2000, and I started my intensive work in 2005 after tsunami. So the, by that time, the domains were lost. And songs that you see or you hear in this book, because the book comes with a QR code. People can scan the QR code and go to the website and hear and view the songs. Those were documented with great difficulty because you can realize people were in the relief camp in post-tsunami in Port Blair. They were dislocated and from the <clears throat> Strait Island. And asking them to sing a song was like, uh, you know, the antithesis of the life they were living. But yet, yeah. initially, Boa Senior was very hesitant. She was the only person who remembered any song. She was 80 plus, And she used to speak a language of Great Andamani's family called Bo. She said, I don't remember any song. She even cursed me once. Roz roz ajate, dimaag kharab karne. You know, because I used to go every day and ask, please sing, please sing. And ultimately, she relented. And when she relented, she realized that the songs worked like balm to her woes and pain, you know. And she sang on her own after that. And she sang, she gave us 66 songs, which, is, which was a treasure trove for me, you see. Only 46 are given in this book because I could not decipher the other completely. In parts I could, but not really. So what I was saying about the language revival, it's, it's possible to do it now because three speakers are there. Zero variety of language can be revived if the government takes initiative. But after they are gone, it would not be very much possible like Hebrew. Let me also share with you another fact, which we linguists know very well. When a language is revived, it does not get revived in its fullest form. So don't think this uh, Hebrew which has come back is the same old Hebrew which was lost. And that's why linguists call it uh, not Hebrew, but Israelistics, or you can say Israeli language, you see. So it's an Israeli language. 
it's not the same Hebrew because those domains are lost where Hebrew was lost. And let me also share with you, there are some unique features in every language. When language is revived, those unique features don't come back. And Great Andamanis has super great, unique features which are not shared by any, any language in the world so far. And that's why I think perhaps it has the traces of the possible human language. When the human languages were evolving, maybe this language has the possibility of showing us the archaic structures of those language, human languages which evolved eventually into this form which we are now here. So if the Great Andamanis is revived, it will lose its unique features. Any language which is, you see, even Maori, if you remember the story of Maori in uh, Australia, the language was revived beautifully because the linguists and the other people, language activists had docu documented the language in various domains. So they could, in, even in, you know, they had also documented in formal speech, informal speech, and varieties of uh, signboards or any kind of writing they did. But unfortunately, Great Andamanis was never documented with, uh, with this uh, uh, depth uh, before us. And uh, the Britishers did leave a very copious documentation of the South Andamanis language, Akabea. You see, they have a dictionary. And Portman also had a comparative uh, word list of many North Andamanese language, Central Andamanese language, and Onge. But the in-depth study was not really uh, done. And of course, there was no audio and video recording as such. So documentation uh, does bring the possibility of language revival, but with some limitations. Yeah, And you have vividly conveyed the terrible sense of loneliness of this old woman what lost mm -hmm. her. She was the last speaker of the language and there are no ones she could talk to. So I really, with great vividness, conveyed her sense of sadness, the loneliness mm -hmm. of the last speaker of a language that comes through very vividly in your narrative. You have mentioned how relocating these tribes caused them grief and misery and tore them away from their jungle and hunting sites. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that the arrival of the so-called modernity in the Andamans proved a disaster for these tribes? Or would you consider this an extreme statement or position? This no, they, order arriving in the island and in a way disrupting and destroying their ecosystem or lives. And so what would be your take on this? You see, uh, <clears throat> when tribes are dislocated, of course, they, they lose the contextualization of the words and the language they had been using. So that leads to very radical and very speedy loss of language because uh, you have no bearings, you see. But more than, uh, as far as the great Indomanis are concerned, more than dislocation, their problem is little more severe. You see, they had been subjugated first by the Japanese invasion, then by the Britishers who really brought in, innumerable and various kinds of diseases into the island of to which these Andamanis were not immune to. So they died of various kinds of diseases. Their children were abused. They were, so they had, they had to face through several kinds of subjugation, both economical, political, cultural, and also sexual assault, you see. So all these things, all these factors lead to led to the Andamanis uh, oblivionity. And when they were moved to the Strait Island, it was pretty late in life in 70s that the government found, and wisely so they did, you know, they found a couple of Andamanis loitering around in some of the northern Andaman islands, especially in Maya Bandar and where the Boa senior came from. And they collected them and put them in Strait Island, thinking that they would survive. And they did. There's no doubt about it. And government of India thought that they will intermingle with people like us, and then they may lose their culture and language and also their habitat. So they did move in good faith. But Strait Island is no patch uh, with the kind of islands they were living in. Because I remember Boa Senior describing various kinds of clays, various kinds of medicinal plants, which she thought were very useful for her diseases, for her pain, and so on and so forth. So, you know, but she could not 
initially she did not even remember the names because she could not show me those plants. So if you don't show me the plants, that the context is lost. Yet we were able to uh, extract 91, 97 names of birds. And I have a book on birds, Great Andamani's names of birds. And also we collected 151 names of fish. So Kalinga Institute being in Odisha would be happy to know that, yeah, they had 50, at least we collected, I'm sure they had many more, 21 names for crabs and various kinds of ecological and other information which is lost by dislocating tribes. The modern generation Great Andamanis do not recognize the plants that I have the names of in my dictionary. It's like an encyclopedic dictionary where we noted down all these with pictures. Some pictures, some not because they were not available. And I realized for the first time that I did not know that fish is a seasonal food, you know, because coming from a vegetarian family, I did not realize that fish is like a, you know, seasonal element. So the kind of fishes I saw in December, I saw very different one in March, a different one in July and so on and so forth. And each fish has a distinct quality, distinct aroma and distinct way of preparation. So all this knowledge is gone because these people have been moved. And this happens with the tribes in central India. This happens tribes with the northeast or wherever, wherever government wants to dislocate the tribes. They do not just dislocate them physically. They dislocate them and they uproot them emotionally as well as culturally, which is the worst kind of subjugation. Yeah. So indigenous communities often find the presence of researchers disruptively intrusive. Would you tell us a little bit about how you managed to establish a wonderful rapport with them and win their trust and affection with that researchers and learn a lot from that because yours is a more vivid experience of dealing with these very difficult situations in a unique and innovative way. So how did you win that trust and affection? You have given some account of it in a book, but I think viewers would like to listen to it more about. Jatinji, what I will tell you, I do not know, many of the researchers may not agree with me, but uh, <clears throat> because there are code of ethics, there are ethics, you know, rules of ethics to work on languages and others, but you have to decide according to the situation. I think, I mean, I didn't think it objectively till you asked me, but I think uh, why I got trust, why I earned that trust and faith in me Maybe because I shared their joys and sorrows with them, you see, and I spoke their language, even it was broken. But when you try to, when you attempt to speak their language, they realize that you are one of them. And you would be surprised that even till now I get a phone call from any of the younger generations. And Licho used to generally ask me, should I, madam, shall I do this? Shall I do that? And I used to laugh, how can I guide you? whether you should go ahead and buy a boat or not, you know, kind of things, you know, which is pertaining to Andaman. So I think the uh, earning their faith in you and also showing, giving them honor and dignity, show your humility. Generally, these researchers go and they, are, they think they are over and above these so-called tribes and they know more than them. But if you try to become their student, if you try to learn from them, if you show humility and give them the dignity and honor that they deserve, I think that shows, uh, that brings their, their faith in you. I remember Boa Senior used to hold my hand and she wouldn't let me go to Delhi. She says, no, you cannot leave me because once you go, I'll stop speaking. And uh, I said, but I do not know Bo. So she said, no, but you know, because I just used to throw a few words and make small phrases that I had learned. But she felt so nice, you know. So she she used to ask me to get a few things which are very intimate to her. And she said, I cannot even ask her these young girls. She never had any children, but she had young girls who would look after him. Her, she will ask me, bring me chappals, bring me lungi, bring me this, bring me that. I said, okay. So she would always tell me what she required. But I, whenever I said, when I'm not here, why don't you ask the, the, the tribal welfare department? Because they are there. They have crores of rupees just for your welfare. They said, she said, no, koi ni sunta hamari. <laughs> nobody hears us. So you bring us. So that kind of trust uh, that uh, perhaps I developed, I do not know how did I do it, but 
that helped me and that helped me in eliciting and as i've as you must have noticed in these stories they are not just stories alone they are also the process of narration uh, elicitation sorry the process of elicitation yes. from a dying language and many friends friends of mine suggested to me that you do put this this was initially part of my diary not part of this book but then many of my literary friends uh, friends from literature as well as friends from linguists they said you must put this also in your book otherwise how the world will know that how to elicit material from a dying language and a in a community which is almost decimated so this is what i tried to do and you may know that while i'm narrating uh, the process i'm also sh i'm also showing a big honor to them and being very easily accessible to them i remember now junior knocking at my door early in the morning i had not even got up but he remembered a story and i'm sure he was such a polite person and very caring that he thought madam i should not wake up madam it's 5 o'clock in the morning and i do not know how he could have have a wink of sleep because he he remembered the entire story and he was living with the characters of the story whole night and he just couldn't sleep so you know this kind of sharing was also a little new for me i had never been so immersed uh, with the culture and with the with the experiences of the community as i did in with great and manis thanks yeah, to them so thanks to uh, them researchers will learn a lot from your example and your experience i'm sure there is no doubt about it uh maybe my last question mm -hmm. uh language loss is a crisis that must be threatening many indigenous communities in india and elsewhere as an eminent linguist who has done seminal work in this field what would be your advice on how this crisis can be combated what policies can be put in place so this is something that exercises minds yeah. of many people languages are dying can be yeah. particularly among indigenous communities what can we do about it is there anything that people can do about it? or the government or some policies can can they be put in place well yeah a lot can be done provided there is a will uh as far as the uh, to survive to make the language survive the 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 beginning stage can be done right in the very heart of the community you see the so anganwadi schools or the primary schools wherever you know they i'm talking about in general can introduce a home language or the mother tongue or the heritage language in a school for expression and as you know in kindergarten or nursery school or nursery class or even till class 1 you don't need books really you basically need the kind of uh, language which has power to narrate that's very important and i realize the important the power the the power the powerful instrument of called narration which our children are losing because they are never made to narrate they are only made to read and write you see so it's very important that the children right from the very beginning should be encouraged to speak in their language in school and the school language should be the heritage language of that community and after couple of years it can be moved to the state language so for example in andaman case i suggested to the administration that let the language be taught in the uh, anganwadi and as well as in the vivekananda school where the children are of very uh, most of the other communities let them have in the zero hour you know all schools have a zero hour So in the zero hour, let the Great Andamanese language be taught because there are you have so many children from the Andaman, and they can be very happy uh, to do it. To give you an information, Jatin ji, I also uh, this language, Great Andamanese language, is not not in the orbit of our orthographization. I gave a script to this language. I produced a, we produced a Varnamala with the help of now junior and my research assistant Abhishek Avdans. and we distributed this varnamala into the uh, uh community and you won't believe the children were so happy to see the varnamala because it was pictorial varnamala and they told me they said uh, we have already learned our language but just by reading a word they thought they could they have known the language so the kind of enthusiasm that you can imbibe in the in the children is by introducing the language in the early stages of life in fact when M, this uh, 
uh, I had proposed, I had been proposing for last 20 years, MLEP, Multilingual Education in Phases. But uh, now it is showing some results because a new education policy 2020 that came out, uh, when I was reading the various clauses of the new education policy, I realized that uh, uh, the, sorry, Yes. Can you see me? Because I yes. have, I do not know yeah. what I do. I, see you. I hope others are also able to see you. Oh, oh. I think I lost. Uh, yeah, now it's okay. I somehow. Uh, so the what I was saying that uh, the if the language is introduced early in life, it can be saved, and it also bring dignity and honor. Uh, to the community and gradually they can move on to the state language and Hindi and English and so on and so forth. So the education policy has to be geared in order to save these languages. That's the only hope. But in addition to that, the community has to show the will. Unfortunately, great Andamanis do not show the will to preserve their language and this is interlinked with the uh, external forces. See, the external forces show that the, they are speaking a jungle Bhasha, so they don't feel very honored. But things have changed since we started documenting because now they flaunt that the language has a script and the language has this book and that book. So I suppose we need to, number one, we should script these languages as soon as possible. And I had suggested to the government of India that they should start this uh, a kind of a revolution because there are still 800 languages in India which are not we don't have a script. So the script should be given so that the languages can be read and written. And then the material could be distributed. The oral tradition has to be saved. See, these languages have survived primarily because of the oral tradition has survived. They had no script. They had no documents, but they have survived. So oral tradition should also be introduced into the class curriculum. Oral should tradition should not be looked down upon. We, we very much need our oral tradition to be intact. So okay. this, yeah. this is these are few of the measures that we can take, but this this uh, calls for another lecture. Yeah. Uh, it has been a great learning experience for me. I'm sure the viewers would share my feelings. And I'm, I have no doubt that many questions are arising in their minds and if they uh, Raise those questions. I think Professor Abhi would be only too glad to, too happy yes. to answer them. So questions. I think if there are any questions. Yeah, uh, I can see them. on my uh, screen is Aditya Bharat. Uh, Sitanshu, is this is the question that you want me to answer? Great conversation. My, how can we record digitize our lost languages and how communities be a part of this process? You see, uh, as far as the digitization of lost languages are concerned, documentation is a very technical field. You'll have to join a linguistics department where language documentation is taught to understand how to document and digitize it. But leaving the technological part out, the communities, whatever they speak, you can certainly these days recording is so possible. You can record them. And you can uh, translate word by word by asking them the meaning of words. And you can have an interlinear translation that way. And you can also have a line by translation, which I have given in this book. You can see the, you can read the in the book. There are five appendices in which I have given line by translation. So you can see how that has to be recorded. It is certainly can be done, but you have to involve the community. Without the help of the community, you cannot do it. Okay, which is the next question? I can't see here. Yeah, so. The organizers can uh, read out if they are listening. Yeah, there is a comment, but then no question, so. Hmm. Ah, I think. Okay, thank you, uh, Momita. If you have any questions, you may ask. <laughs> uh, 
I can read the comment you just posted. Okay. Uh, so I'm getting only the comments. Maybe these organizers can help us sort the questions. Thank you, Abha. I'm happy you liked it. Now, how do you uh, see the role of the government? So, <coughs> someone has asked me, how do you the see the role of minutes, the I have last few minutes, I did elaborate. The, the government has to modify its language policy or the education policy in a way that the heritage languages are given due importance at the beginning stages of learning uh, of the child. We, we eventually, we normally forget that when a child enters schools, he's already a bilingual. He knows his language and he also knows perhaps the other language of the state. This is true of the city life or the shahari zindagi. But if you go into the villages and the remote areas, the children know their heritage language so well they know about everything that happens around them and in their ecological environment. So the government should tap this resource rather than considering them uh, low trodden people or people who do not know much, they should be considered treasure house of knowledge and let the child express his views, his thoughts, his thinking, his cognition also uh, in the language. I remember the I generally give the examples of the nine shades of blue that the Maya language had once upon a time. Nine shades of blue. Because they could visualize the butterflies in their jungle of different blue colors. But when the Maya language was translated into Spanish, they did not have nine shades of blue, so they translated into three shades of blue. With the result, when the Maya, the younger generation of Maya started reading the Spanish dictionary uh, or the, the, about their own language, they lost the cognition of the other six shades of blue because there were no words for it and they were not taught about it. So as I said in the beginning of my lecture that uh, language encodes uh, your thoughts, language encodes your cognition, that's a very important aspect of language. That's why we should not let the languages lose because when we lose, we also lose part of our cognition. We stop perceiving of, you know, many things around us that way. And this is very true of the Northeastern languages spoken. I have worked on them and I've written about them, that there are something called expressive words that they are losing because the younger generation doesn't has not been taught in schools about those words. <clears throat> There's another question. Is it really possible to teach these dying languages like the way we teach other languages? <clears throat> I think I answered this question during my talk. Yes, it is possible, provided you have enough material to teach. But to begin with, you can start teaching with the oral tradition. You, you hire or you invite somebody from the community in your class. And there you can begin You know, by learning from him. This can certainly be made possible. Don't be cowed down by the fact that, oh, there's no teaching material. This is the often complaint I hear from teachers. Oh, we don't have teaching material. How can we teach? Your teaching material is roaming around all, all around you. You see, they're living teaching material. They have sustained their language for thousands of years just through the oral tradition. Our, if you remember, our Shastras were also for a long time were not written down till Rig Veda was written in 1500 BC. They were all passed on through the oral tradition. So oral tradition is very, very strong. Don't undermine it, you see. And it's ever evolving. The beauty about the oral tradition, it's ever evolving. It's always new. It is the, for fro it is the written tradition which is frozen in time and space, but not the oral tradition. So don't think there are no teachers around. Just call somebody from the community, a male member, a female, elderly people. They know a lot, like Boa knew a lot. I was uh, enamored by the, these old people who knew so much, you know. But I had a very different uh, position because I reached the island where the language was almost extinct. But you can certainly do it with those languages which are not extinct or not almost extinct. Because there are many elderly, elderly 
uh, people in the community who would like to help you. <clears throat> uh, there's another question by Mary Mohanty. Is there any other dying language in India? Well, uh, yes, there are, there are many languages which are uh, on the verge of dying because they are not being sustained, not because they are not powerful. They are powerful enough. I was uh, just uh, looking at the, some figures. There are 200 languages in India which are spoken by less than 10 speakers. So they must be dying because the demographic situation is not very helpful to them. So when the demography does not help me helpful, that means there are very few people. And there are generally in such cases what happens, the, the, the fluent speakers are only those who are elders. And the younger generation has a, either a passive knowledge of the heritage language or they don't want to use it. Then those are dying. But there are, in addition to these 200 languages, there are 178 or 80 languages, 180 languages, which are spoken by less than 10 to 50 speakers. So even if you have 50 speakers, there are very, very few in order to sustain these languages over a long period of time. So yes, languages are there in India, which are also on the, uh, maybe on the verge of dying. And there are some languages, quite a few languages are in Kashmir. And there are quite a few languages in the northeast of India in various uh, states. But there are languages also in central India. In Odisha also, you had uh, 42 tribes, I suppose. But all 42 tribes don't speak their respective languages. Some of them are almost gone. So there are a large number of languages, 200 plus less. We can, can include 180 also. So that makes 380, almost 400 languages, which are which are need which need to be saved. Uh, there's another question: languages, because the tales you shared on how you retrieved information about the Andamanese people and their language was so challenging. So is it really possible? <laughs> well. I made it possible, <laughs> so you can do it too. I'm an old woman, but you have all the age in front of you. You can do it, certainly, and you should start doing it from today. Why waste any time? It is possible. What you need is a is a uh, what you said uh, the will, and also the be prepared for very hard work. It's not an easy thing. It's not easy on your on your body also because. I know you do create, you do have a lot of problems. When I reached Ireland, I was not in a very healthy situation because of some surgery I had. But you know, I put everything back and I didn't listen to my doctor and treaded all the jungles. So it is the will of you which makes you healthy ultimately, and you are able to do it. And the God, if you believe in God or nature, whatever, whoever your ancestors, they will help you. Now I believe more in ancestors than God because that's what Andaman is taught me. The ancestors knew you and they are around you. They believe the ancestors surround you all the time to protect you and they don't smell. The only people or the only things that smell are the other things in life. Your computer smells, your books smell, the pebbles smell, the sea smells, you and I smell. So there's a smelling world and there's a non-smelling world. So the, the world which is without any odor and smell protects you. So think of those and go ahead in this mission. Uh, Ashutosh Das says it was great yeah. to have the sagas of yeah. literature. Yeah. So, what is my question is how tough it was to fathom their thought process and convince the island people. Oh, you see, it was not done on a, in one day. I had to be constantly going there and uh, intermittently be with them. The thought process does not come out in words. It comes out comes out in the language they speak. And also it comes out in their grammar. You will be surprised to know this. So when I was uh, working on the grammar, I realized they had many constructions which I had not heard of. And when I asked, uh, they said, you know, to explain to me why this construction is there, I got to know this is how they're thinking. For example, when they have to, anything that comes out of the body, you know, your stool, your urine, st sweat, anything, the noun, these names have to be preceded by a kind of a proclitic, as we say in linguistics, which is reserved, uh, reserved for the uh, emission. So you have to say, 
and the word is well oath generally monosyllable oath oath so anything that comes out of the body you have to put oath and oath in front of that word but when you have to go out of your room you have to put the same word oath go the word for going is chone so you'll say oath chone and i didn't understand initially why why the chone has to be preceded by a clitic it's a verb and then they said no but you are coming out <laughs> and then i put two and two together you see how the thought process works similarly somebody who's very beautiful very nice person he has to be the, the adjective beautiful has to be preceded by a a is for internal body parts the things that you don't see like pancreas your stomach your blood things of sort so if somebody is beautiful inside it has to you have to say sheila is a beautiful a bungoi is the word a bungoi but if sheila is beautiful to look at like if she's participating in miss india let's say then it has to be sheila is air bungoi because air is the particle or the clitic which is reserved for the external beauty so this is the thought process that they see the world through their body and this i understood after a long time when i cracked the puzzle of the grammar it took me almost more than a year to crack the grammar and believe it i have worked on more than 90 languages of india i have never come across such a difficult grammar so i had i was really challenged and i think i remember i was a guest scientist at max planck institute in germany when i was trying to crack this puzzle and when i did i realized it was so simple it was so simple but i couldn't get it but ever because i was not looking at the world through the eyes of the great indomanis i was looking at the world through the eyes of a hindi speaker you see so the thought process you have to get into the under the skin as they say in english you have the you have to share the thought process for that you have to learn their language and the beauty of their language hey okay, i think we have come to the end of the discussion so i thank professor abi for sharing her thoughts with us for provoking thought and for enriching our understanding of this fascinating world so thank you all very much and i thank everyone i think thank you jatin ji and thank you everybody else who has joined us and he'll be watching us little later i'll be very happy if you mail me your thoughts or your questions on anvitaabbi@gmail.com but i will also like to uh, tell you that i have a website for andamanis which you may like to look at it's called www.andamanis.net andamanis.net or you just type voga v o g a vanishing voices of great andamanis that will also take you to this website please do look up this website and please mail me whenever you have any question i enjoyed talking to jatin ji you and also oh, it was my pleasure so thank you very much thank thank you everyone okay